Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jade, and I'm the co-director for Youth Near Australia. Welcome to our webinar. This is the first time we're actually hosting one, so I'm actually new to using this, and hopefully everything goes okay. Um, as just a brief intro, if you have any questions, feel free to put um, or to comment in the chat. Um, and as a heads up, it takes, there's around like a three second lag when I receive questions. Um, so there will be a little bit of a delay when I actually respond to them. Um, hopefully you can see things on the whiteboard. Um, I'm gonna be going through a few things depending on our time. What I'm planning to do is we'll have one and a half hours total-ish. We'll finish at around 6.30. Um, for the first five or so minutes, uh, just the brief introduction, the last five to 10 minutes, any questions that are unrelated to the topic as well, feel free to ask me and I'll do my best to answer them. So, okay, now that's all out of the way, um, a brief introduction of myself. My name is Jade, like I said, and I won the 2015 International Brain Bee, which was held in Cairns, Australia. So it was the first year I was in Australia and I, didn't really travel anywhere because of that. But I did the state round in 2014 and I did reasonably well in that to have passed <laughs> and gone on with the rest of the competition. Um, for the state round, the main difference is, well, just with regards to the brain beat, since this webinar is mostly focused on, I guess, preparation for the state rounds and not just general neuroscience education, which I will cover regardless. The the state round is more, it's very, no matter what I teach you, a lot of it is going to be based on the exact wording from the textbook. And the textbook has not changed. The version is still the 2012 version rather than the 2018. There are a lot of different things regarding the fact that you are studying the 2012 version and it's been almost, it's been seven years since um, it was 2012. So a lot of things are actually out of date, but that's fine. Okay. So feel free to stop me whenever you want me to explain anything else. Um, I'm going to be covering a few things, quite a few things that are outside of the textbook that's going to help you actually understand how, well, how to piece everything together so you can actually remember things better. And it would seem less like it's rote learning. So this will actually take some time. I don't know how much you guys have covered on neuroanatomy, but the most I saw in the state round textbook and in the local round is basic lobes of the brain. So I have this really cool model that I'm gonna use for today as well. And pretty much this is also be one, not only a quick revision for those that have studied a lot. Um, it is in, I think, I think your competition is next week. So you'll actually see us around at the state round. I won't personally be there, but a lot of my colleagues who work at YNA will be around. So feel free to ask us any questions then as well. Okay. So to start, what I'm going to do is, I'm not sure if you can see the whiteboard, but I am mostly going to be focusing on a full introduction to neuroanatomy. And then I might go into more neurophysiology because I know that's really difficult for a lot of people. And I might finish off with just a few notes on the developing nervous system just because it ties in well with neuroanatomy and it is like the other topics here that it's normally quite difficult to get the grasp of. All right. So what I have, I have a white cord with me and all this. And I'll also be going through neurotransmitters, action potentials and all that if I can cover everything as quickly as I can. All right. Okay. So to start off, I okay, the, the challenge of having a webinar as well is I don't know if you guys will actually understand what I get because I can't see what you guys are feeling or um, I don't really know if you guys want me to explain more on things. So feel free just to tell me in the comments if things have already been covered or if I need to slow down, all right? So just message me like slow down Jade or something, <laughs> okay? So first off, a really important thing to note is, I remember for local round, um, do you guys know the difference between a really basic, really basic neuroanatomy concept, which is cerebrum versus cortex? 
because the main difference is that your cerebrum is this entire chunk of brain, the main mass of the brain, and then your cortex is, if I split this open, right, your cortex is just the outer layer, and this outer layer is also known as gray matter, right, um, and meanwhile, the inside layer, as you guys probably know, it's going to be white matter. I'm going to be going through more more detail about what gray matter and white matter actually are and how to actually think about the terms that are associated with them. But for now, that's the main difference, okay? So the cortex, when you're referring to the cortex, it's just the outer layer of the of cerebral release in this case, right? Okay, so that's the cerebrum. This as well is the cerebellum, as you guys probably know. And then you have the rest of the brainstem here, right? Okay, so now for, okay, let's go through, I'm gonna go through what gray matter and white matter are. Okay, so you guys probably know that gray matter is, you know, the collection of all the neurons. So let me grab my whiteboard marker. Okay, let's say, Let's say these are your neurons, right? In your cerebrum, this is my giant brain, right? Okay, this is my giant brain. And this should be in your outer cortex part. I should have drawn that higher. <laughs> okay, stay up here. Yep. So, in your cortex, it's known as gray matter because it has all of the dendrites and cell bodies of the neurons. Meanwhile, all the white matter is made of all these traps, right? Now, the reason why it's white is because it's covered in a myelin sheath. And as some of you may know, the myelin sheath is actually formed by, the, I guess, the fatty layer of uh, another set of cells known as glial cells. Uh, I'll be going through more detail of glial cells after this, but just need to know that the myelin sheath is what makes this white, right? Okay, so for white matter, there are two main words that you will probably see associated with them. Those are traps and fasciculi, all right? So I'm just gonna spell that out for you. Let's spin off, okay. So you have in white matter, these are just some terms we need to be aware of. One is tracts, fasciculi, or fasciculus, singular, so it's fasciculus, um, commissure, and decrustation. Now, these words you will probably come across. Um, quite a bit. One famous tract, actually, a white, famous white matter tract is the corpus callosum, right? And that's the one, the main one that wraps around the center, I guess, the center bit of the brain, if I could take apart my model. So you can see this little pink curve, right? That's your corpus callosum. And that actually connects, it is a set of fibers that connects both sides of the hemispheres together for communication. Now there are other tracks that cross midline and those are also, those are these two terms, right? Commissures and decussations. So just sets of white matter tracks that cross midline, okay? So if you ever come across anything that says, for example, anterior, posterior, commissure, um, things like that, it just means it crosses midline and it's going to be a white matter tract. A fasciculus is just another name for a tract, right? Okay. So, those are just some terms. Okay, some other things, nuclei. Now, when I was talking about, when I was talking about tracts, or saying how this forms a tract, right, I think you can see the green. This forms a tract. These neurons here, together, they can form, they can form nuclei, not necessarily in the cortex, but a group of them can form a nucleus. Right, so that's what they mean by a nuclear. There are two kinds of nuclei, right? There's going to be 
a nucleus that is a group of cell bodies, and they can also be the nucleus of the cell, which is the little like circle that you can normally draw in the soma of the cell, right? Okay, so that's very, very basic introduction to main major terms that I will be using quite a bit. Okay. So, um, okay. The other thing I'm going to cover is some different planes and orientation just briefly. So when you have when you have a brain, when you see brain slices in your textbook, there are three main slides that you'll see, right? So planes. So you have horizontal. Sagittal and coronal. Right? Okay. I drew like a really terrible picture. This would be the sagittal plane. This would be your coronal plane. It's a bit like a cauliflower. Okay, so. These are your three planes. I'm gonna show you what, what I mean by these cross sections. I accidentally booked a room that didn't have a projector, so I'm trying my best to draw diagrams, <laughs> okay? So, for example, on this plane right here, this is already the sagittal plane, right? Sagittal just means if you cut directly anyway this way, right, of your head, you'll get an image like this. So this would be, for example, this in particular is the mid-sagittal plane, because it's directly down the middle of the brain, right? Now you also have coronal and horizontal. Coronal is pretty much cutting down like this in the front of your head, right? Just like that, and it forms these forward slices. And the last slice is horizontal, and that's just cutting across horizontally, right? It's also known as transverse. So when you have the brain, pretty much this is like the very top, the superior view, um, the superior horizontal view, right? Alrighty, okay. Now, last bit of, I guess, an orientation to neuroscience is we have, this one's a bit tricky if you guys haven't heard of it before, but don't be too bad. So this is your brain. Now, we have different orientations that we talk about things, right? You have the main, I guess the main one that everyone, main two that everyone talks about, and this is going to be this way and this way, right? Just your normal compass points. What I mean by this is you have these two directions. You have superior, inferior, and you also have anterior, so towards the front, of your head, right? And posterior. So towards the back. In neuroscience in particular, the reason why we can't only use these two axes is because they're, the brain actually curves around quite a bit. So I'm not sure if you guys have noticed in, um, especially in the developing nervous system part, but generally when you see diagrams of things, of, of structures inside the brain, such as, for example, the corpus callosum, you notice how there's a C shape a lot. So a lot of structures like the corpus callosum, fornix, a lot of um, a lot of the tracks all follow this kind of curvature. And that's a result of, in the development, at least when the developing brain is forming, it forms a kind of C shape and actually forms a lot of bends that we will go through later on if I have time, right? And as a result, you want to try and reference things. For example, if you try and describe a location here, you can say that, oh, this compared to, say, if I drew this as if this is a thalamus right in the middle, right? Okay, thalamus is kind of just really central in the brain. If I drew this and I have the hypothalamus here, and it actually is here, right? So that's a thalamus, that's the hypothalamus, right? And you want to describe exactly where the hypothalamus is. You could technically say, you know, anterior, inferior, 
um, to the thalamus, but we have some other terms, right? Some of these terms include this. So one is if I drew arrows going in like that, this be known as ventral. And for this, Anything that goes out like that, you know, as dorsal, right? So, by if you guys remember, like when you when you eat, oh, well, we don't really eat that. So, when you have a structure of the brain here, what you're talking about is just this part in comparison to say, okay, let's do this way. So, when we have this structure, you can say that the corpus callosum is dorsal to well the um, posterior and the other course of corpus callosum is dorsal to the thalamus, right? I mean, well, the hypothalamus, which is here and it's located here, is going to be ventral to the thalamus, right? Okay, so that's one level of, there's one last level, and that's going to be rostral and caudal. I'm trying to find my other pen. Oops, this is so there's this very last one here. Okay, so remember that C shape I was talking about, right? So you have this axis again, except it goes down like that, right? Goes down like that. So what we have here is now two ends, except it could be, at first it seems like it's the same as anterior and in humans and Rodents as well, it does overlap quite a lot, but this end is known as rostral. Right, rostral just means towards the nose. Yeah. Meanwhile, this end is known as caudal, and it means towards the tail. So if something is caudal to another thing, it just means it's towards the tailbone, if you want to remember it like that. Yeah. For example, the spinal cord is in a much caudal position compared to the you know prefrontal cortex, which is very rostral, right? Okie dokie. So this is, I think you can see that already, I'm just gonna rub it off again. And as a heads up, if I am going too fast, all of this is recorded, so you can always go back to it and copy anything down that you missed, right? Okay, so now the next thing I'm gonna go through is Basic, I think it is safe to say that you guys have probably covered neurons quite extensively. So I'm just going to go a bit more into glial cells so that you can have a better understanding of what glial cells are and how they're related to everything. Because I, as I can remember, glial cells are kind of chucked in the book a lot. And during my state round, I remember one question I didn't get was, I think it was something like, it was like, what kind of cells provide the myelin sheath? Or like, what kind of cells wrap around um, the axons of neurons? And for me, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know that the myelin sheath were cells. I thought that it was just like a fatty layer that was produced by another cell and placed on top, but they're actually the cells, okay? So that's just a heads up, and that was from my, my experience. It was a very memorable moment for me because I was a bit sad after that. I don't think I would have made it to the individual round and I made it so far. So you guys will be fine on the day. Yeah? Okay, so what we have is, I'm just going to draw you a neuron again. Okay. I'm not going to draw in the myelin sheets just yet. This is your neuron. Now, from what you know is the myelin sheath wraps around the axons. Just like that, right? However, that's not the only thing. I'm gonna rub a bit of this on. However, that's not the only thing or the only way to look at this. More importantly, you need to know that these things are cells. So for now, for example, I'm drawing a particular kind of cell. This is known as a Schwann cell. Right? These little things, this is the nuclei, and these are the little bumps, right? These are Schwann cells. 
and they in particular are found only in the peripheral nervous system. Meanwhile, in the central nervous system, you find a different kind of glial cell, right? So you have the Schwann cell here, and if you guys can answer questions, that would be nice. We'll ask questions anyway, just to test you. But what's the central nervous system equivalent of the Schwann cell? Um, yep, so it's the oligodendrocyte. Right? But the difference in the oligodendrocyte is I could draw in another neuron as well. Say so I draw this dude in. I normally draw nice neurons, but it's time apparently. So we have this other neuron, and it also has myelin sheath. Now, also know that not all nerves have myelin sheath on them. But at least at this level, just think of it like this. Um, the only one that you may have to know that doesn't have a myelin sheath would be the unmyelinated C fibers, which is involved in pain sensation. So if you've looked in your textbook, there, there are two fibers that are involved in pain, and that's alpha delta, right? Sorry, A delta, not alpha delta, my problem. A delta. A-delta fibers and C fibers. Yep, A-delta fibers are the ones that carry really fast like shocks, um, that kind of prickly, super fast pain. Um, the reason for that is because of the myelin sheath and, and this is very hard to structure without being able to ask questions to you guys, um, which is normally a major thing when I teach, but does anyone know what the the property is called that the myelin sheath have or that permit um, or that the myelin sheath permits action potentials to have. So it's saltatory conduction, right? Okay, so saltatory conduction is that kind of jumping mechanism that you see in a lot of diagrams of action potential. That's how it jumps really fast and travels down the axon, down axons even to a meter in length, so that you don't actually have to have any major delays whilst it's traveling, right? And this is because myelin sheath is a very good conducting material, right? So alpha delta not only has myelin sheath, but also has very thin, a very thin diameter of the axon, which means that there's less resistance. So it's even faster than the larger unmyelinated C fibers, which deliver a slow burning pain. Right. Okay, so back to glial cells, oligodendrocytes are these little things. And they project out like this. So they can myelin make multiple, multiple myelin sheets and also multiple neurons, right? So this is known as an oligodendrocyte. Now the difference is the oligodendrocyte is found only in the CNS. And the CNS, what's inside the CNS, guys? It's just the brain and the spinal cord, okay? Any of the nerves that come out of the spinal cord that you see, and you'll see these in any major thing of, that was a terrible brain that I drew, but it's fine. So this is your brain and spinal cord, right? Spinal cord, and your brain also has some nerves as well, and these are known as cranial nerves, if you guys have seen them. But you have some cranial nerves that go out here, and you also have a lot of spinal nerves, right? They're actually, I'm not sure why I'm alternating them, <laughs> but okay. So you have all these nerves coming out. All of this, though it seems like it could be a part of the central nervous system, is not only the brain, strictly the brain and the spinal cord, right? All this is peripheral nervous system, including the cranial nerves, okay? I will go through more about how the categorization works as well with the nervous systems. So... You, this is only in the CNS, and its main role is to myelinate um, the axons of neurons in the brain, right? And another way to remember it is also the fact that it's oligo, oligo meaning like a 
couple more than two <laughs> at least, um, two to five ish, and that pretty much means that that's how many branches that it typically myelinates. Oh. Branches of itself. Probably so. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. So we've covered. Those are the two main glial cells. There are actually quite a few more. I just, due to time restrictions, I probably won't be able to cover them, but I can just tell you verbally right now, you have things known as astrocytes. Astrocytes are also only found in the central nervous system. They are very fluffy um, glial cells and they help nourish, they help nourish neurons and provide the nutrients from the blood vessels, and help maintain them, maintain synapses. So, so they kind of just do everything, right? Um, you also have a few others, there's, there's um, epidermal cells, which line these things called the chorid plexus, and oh, sorry, they line ventricles. So they're like line ventricles, and they help secrete cerebrospinal fluid. And that's the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, okay? So if you guys haven't heard of that, you can write it down so that you don't Forget cerebrospinal fluid. Now these have a lot of functions, including clearing things. But okay, the main thing that you just need to know about it is that it does help act like a shock absorber. So your brain isn't directly when your skull gets hit or something doesn't actually have to hit the skull in itself. It it's kind of cushioned by this layer of fluid. Okay, and this fluid is also found in the ventricles and the cycles around. Now, okay. Oh, one other important note is in your textbook, it will say that the rate of neuron, or the ratio of neurons to glial to glial cells is that they are ten times less. Uh, there are ten times less the amount of neurons compared to glia, and you probably would see in a lot of things there are a lot of different numbers. From what I understand now, it's we see them as they are actually equal in number. Yeah, great. Oh, okay. People are replying. This is great. We use in the comment section. Great, guys. Okay, so um, in um, oh, I wasn't doing a thought. I got really distracted. But anyway, that's fine. Let's talking about glial cells. Yeah. So what is actually current thinking is that there are this, there are equal amounts of neurons as glial cells. Okay, but for the state round, just remember what your textbook says because that's what they're gonna test you on, and that's that there are 10 times the amount of glial cells compared to neurons. Right? Okie dokie. Okay, so now what do I wanna cover? Oh, okay. I'm gonna cover some actual neuroanatomy now. So I've, I just went over all the really general, really, really, really general um, terms that everyone uses throws around all the time and it kind of expects you guys to know. Um, and if you don't know, it's a, it is a very big issue because it does not help you understand things better, right? Okay, so very quick revision. Okay, so your brain, you have multiple different lobes. Let's divide this nicely. Central. This okay, so this is your brain, right? So I'm going to pause for just a five seconds for you guys to tell me, you know, the comment it or just say in your head what different structures are. Okay, so I'm going to ask what this lobe is. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. I didn't draw that. <laughs> Can I ask you guys what this lobe is? And then what this lobe is? And then what this lobe is? And what this lobe is? And it's a very nice bonus question. Does anyone know what's inside this fissure? There's actually an extra cortex inside there. Oh, let me see my brain. Here's my brain. So inside this fissure, there's actually an extra, I guess, cortex in there, right? If anyone knows that, that will be really nice. <laughs> and you guys will be way, way ahead of the rest of the game, right? Okay, great. 
Cool. Yep. So it's parietal. This is parietal. I don't know why I'm holding it a razor. Sorry. This is parietal. Yeah. This is temporal. Yep. This is, you yeah, want to frontal, then occipital. Right? Now I'm going to go through these functions as a quick test, but inside here, inside that fissure, this fissure is known as the lateral fissure. I'm going to write the name of that down. Okay, this is known as the lateral fissure. Now there are two big fissures for you to remember, but this is one of them, okay? And that's inside it, you have this cortex called the angular. Yeah, have you guys heard of that before? So the insula is actually very, consider it's like an ancient part of cortex, but you have, I think you have three short gyri and, two, oh, I didn't explain the other one, but anyway, three short gyri and two long gyri, right? So if I take apart this brain, I think it has, its function isn't that clear, but just for you to know, it's, it's literally, if you open up the sylvian fissure or the lateral fissure, it's inside here, okay? Now, for each of these functions, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Okay, so, oh, sorry, the last thing I'm going to explain that I accidentally used the term without explaining are uh, these two terms. Have you guys heard of gyrus and sulcus before? If not, don't fret because I think it is not technically in your textbook, although they will mention a few things and won't really explain it. So one will be gyrus and sulcus. Yeah. So now there is a main groove in the middle here that I drew. Does anyone know what that groove is called? The one that, um, the one that I guess breaks the border between frontal and parietal lobes. No? Okay, so that, that groove is called the central sulcus. Yeah? So there's a reason why I'm talking about the sulcus. It's actually extremely important and it will pop up everywhere. Central sulcus. Okay? So, great. And knowing this as well, sulcus therefore means groove. Right, so the sulcus is the grooves inside the brain because, as you know, the brain is wrinkled so that you increase surface area so that you can have more cortex. And this is technically, you know, I guess if you want to have a measure of intelligence, it's better to compare your surface area of cortex rather than the actual size of your brain because even if you have a giant brain, if it's not very wrinkled, you don't really have much cortex, right? So um, that's a fun fun fact for you guys. Yeah, so. The grooves are known as sulci, as plural, and the little, I guess, ridge or bumps in between the the knots, the not the grooves, the little, well, I don't know how to describe, just like the in between parts, right? Not the grooves. Those bits are known as gyri or gyrus singular. Yeah. So when I talk about the gyrus, it's just like that line that I'll or that area I'll be talking about. <laughs> I should know more vocabulary, but I'm kind of on very little sleep at the moment. So I'll do my best. Okay. Now we have the central sulcus. Central sulcus splits up these two. And there are two really critical things, two really critical well, things, gyri, gyri that surround the central sulcus. Okay. Now these have, these are just little regions and I'm just going to label this so that it's a bit easier for you guys to remember. Frontal. Parietal, temporal, and occipital. Yeah? Okay. Now, from the central sulcus, there are these two regions here. Does anyone know what this region is important for? What function or what sensation? What, what is this, I guess, pre-central gyrus is useful? Motor, yes, great. Great guys, motor, okay? So this, the pre-central gyrus, is also known as the primary motor cortex. Awesome, okay, great. Really good, guys, okay? So if you ever forget things, 
just remember, if you go back to your neuroanatomy and you think about you know, what's in front, what's behind, none of that in front of it is going to be your motor control, right? And therefore, frontal, the frontal lobe is going to be involved in motor control. Yeah. Yeah, and great. Yes, Erica. Um, the the next bit is going to be somatosensory. Yeah. So in the posterior or post central sulcus, oh, sorry, post central gyrus, post central gyrus is going to be somatosensory in function. Yeah. It's also known as the primary somatosensory cortex. I'm going to rub this out. Okay, so this is known as your primary. Somatosensory cortex or gyrus. Yeah, now you guys have the freedom to use the word gyrus. Right? Okay, so I'm going to rub a bit of this off as well. Face here into anatomy, come back. Over brain anatomy, not just the branches. That's what you cover these two. Okay, so great. Now you guys know that you are already on a ball because now you know that the parietal lobe also is involved in somato sensation. Yeah? So this is, um, it's it's very critical in like, for example, light touch, vibration, things like that, right? Okay, so another thing about the frontal cortex, very, very simple question, but does anyone know what this region is? The very, very front of the frontal cortex? Anyone know what that's called? Yeah, prefrontal cortex. Vital ball. Okay. Prefrontal cortex, great. And um, so do you guys know what the prefrontal cortex is in charge of? Or what role it has? Close, yeah. It, I think it, it is involved in some emotions, yes. But anything else is a bigger thing, yeah? Definitely high order thinking. But now I'm looking more towards personality as well, right? So it's higher, higher cognitive function, higher order thinking, yes. Um, also personality and also aspects of emotion, yeah? So the reason why I'm talking about the prefrontal cortex is there's gonna be this case study that pops up over and over again. Right. You guys probably have heard of it. It's Phineas Gage. Now, yeah, so Phineas, Phineas Gage is the guy, and I forgot what period of time, but what happened is that he was a railroad worker and there was a little explosion, a little bit, but essentially what happened is that a pole actually flew out and went straight through his prefrontal cortex, right? And what happened to Phineas is that he had major personality changes. He became a lot more angrier, a lot more just there was a less social inhibition, right? So that's what prefrontal cortex is in charge of. There is those aspects of emotion, yes, but also personality and definitely higher order thinking, those things, right? So another thing you guys may have heard of as well, this not necessarily is targeted to the prefrontal cortex, but also can affect just your frontal lobe generally, um, is lobotomy. Now, a lobotomy is an old psychiatric, neuropsychiatric procedure they used in the 60s or something. And for some reason, it went on for a long time before people realized it was not very ethical, right? So what some people did, I remember, I think, in my national round book, they were describing it, um, what you could actually do is you could even walk into GPs and they'd be able to just get a knife, stick it behind your eye, right up into your frontal lobe because it's right here, right? You just stick up the knife behind there and they'll slice it like that and you'll be cured of any mental illness. But that's also because you have basically major brain damage, <laughs> right? Or not necessarily major, but you have enough brain damage to actually change your personality, okay? So those are some fun facts to help you remember about the prefrontal cortex and the role of the frontal lobe, right? So there's gonna be motor control, Right, and there are some other motor association areas around, but motor control and higher order thinking and personality. All right, now we've got that down. Does anyone know what the temporal lobe is in charge of? It's 
it's quite a few things involved, but there are most a few key things that I'm looking out for. Yep, auditory, great, Grace. Yeah, auditory recognition, anything else? So this bit of a lag here. One sec. Okay. Sorry, I just lost my thing. Yep, okay, okay, great. You guys are putting in some really good things. Yep, great, memory, that's what I'm looking for, yeah? There's auditory and memory. Those are the two big things for temporal lobe. Temporal lobe and parietal, they're both involved in quite a bit of integrative processes. So um, I think normally, remember, I normally associate parietal with integration. Um, but you can, I think in your textbook, they also said the temporal is involved in integrative function. Yeah, but integration and in particular temporal lobe, I'll write it here just because my diagram is getting a bit messy. Temporal lobe, auditory function, and memory. Okay, I'm going to, someone mentioned language. I'm going to go into more detail about that after I go through these basic things. The only reason for that is because there is a lot more specificity about where the language areas are in a person and how you look at it and what's involved. So I'm gonna write it here before I forget, but I will definitely cover language before I finish, okay? So, sorry, my handwriting went down really badly. Okay, now, great, so auditory and memory. Reason for this is, if you guys ever forget, remember your temporal lobe is on the side of your head, right? And what's right here on the side of your head? Your ears, you know? So it makes sense for it to be involved in auditory. Um, function, right? And memory as well. Now the other thing, uh, which I don't think it's very clear in this model, but essentially your hippocampus is located inside your temporal lobe. Yeah? Yes, yes. Language involves two areas of broken and Wernicke's areas. Awesome job. Okay. Um, as a bonus question, I'll ask this is an open question before I explain it because I can even talk about it now. But does anyone know where Broca's area is specifically located? Yes, in the frontal cortex? Yeah, any part of the frontal cortex? Yeah, near the frontal cortex? Okay, okay. Those are all, I mean, technically, if I wanted to just give marks out willingly, then yes, frontal cortex, it is in there, but it is in the inferior, yes, it's in the inferior frontal gyrus, right guys? So if I, oh, I have my, I have my awesome model here, okay, so this is, I'm going to use the left side, sorry, so it's the same side as this, right? This is your brain and your broken area is right here, okay, and that's the inferior part of um, your frontal lobe. It's also known as the inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, and in most people, I think it's not, you know, a very large majority of people, inferior frontal gyrus and located here is Broca's area. Broca's area. Yeah, so there's actually, it's a bit more specific than that, but for now, let's just keep it as this, yeah? This is already at a higher level than most people, and it's very good if you can take away anything from this because it will help you enormously, especially on the day when you think about, there is, I think, two sections on the day. So you'll have the individual realm, the first bit, where you answer questions on a PowerPoint. Um, these are just short answer questions. They're not too bad. Don't feel too stressed out. You're sitting down writing you know, pen on paper, so it's actually not as terrifying as going up on stage, right? And the second part is you have the diagram drawing, right? Now, in the diagram section, that's where you could get potential, like, I guess, you'll get a lot of images of brain structures. It is all from a textbook, so if you study from that, you'll be fine. But, you know, if you ever get stuck, and the thing is that I'm... Like, I think it's best to think about things and, you know, at least not trying to write learn, right? So we're trying to actually fully understand, you know, what your brain, how your brain works, yeah, which is already really fascinating. So knowing this, knowing this area, then you can just relate it to the fact that it's Broca's area, which I wrote on the side, and that's not very convenient, but now you know that, 
right? Now, the last language question I'll ask before I explain the other bit, oh, I'll ask two more, but one is, does anyone know what broker's area, if damaged, what would happen? There's a particular name for um, the, um, the condition that occurs, but if you can even describe what happens. Aphasia, yes, there's a particular type of aphasia. You, you can call it broker's aphasia, but you can, yes, non-fluent. Yeah, okay, and what's non-fluent aphasia? You can kind of guess from the name. Yeah, okay, so yeah, they can't speak properly. Now, the thing about the wording of that, just because I'm going to be nitpicky, is that the other aphasia also is associated, just wait, I think yeah. the other aphasia is also associated with not being able to technically speak properly. Yeah? Yes. Well, Grace said. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, broker's, aph broker's aphasia, right, which is um, a, like a damaged language center, essentially. Um, what happens is that, yes, they can comprehend what you say, but they can't produce the words. And the reason for that is, another way to remember it is, remember this is a focus area is in the frontal lobe. And remember how we were saying how the frontal lobe is associated with motor function, right? So it's associated with motor function. It's going to be associated with, what focus area is going to be associated with the actual formation of speech, right? So the motor aspect, the coordination of how I'm, for example, how I'm speaking. Right? So when someone has broken aphasia, if it's really, really bad, they can't say anything at all because they just can't form words. But they'll completely understand what you're saying. Now, the other aphasia is also known as Wernicke's aphasia. Right? You guys, some of you have mentioned it already. But Wernicke's area is located here. It's kind of in the parietal lobe. Um, I, think some, I think some also say temporal as well, but parietal temporal area. It's like around here. I have a mark, I don't know why I'm rubbing things down. Okay, so it's around here, this bit. So, kind of like the junction between parietal and temporal. Now, Wernicke's area is, anyone know what it's in charge of? You can summarize it in one short answer. Speech comprehension, awesome, okay. So yes, it's in charge of speech comprehension. Yeah, so these are the kinds of questions that you could get on the day, but they'll basically ask you um, basic functions, things like that, and the short, it's a very short answer question. It's, you will give literally, for example, the answer speech comprehension, right? Another fancy, oh, another good question I remember was something like um, asking about, you know, what's, that's a fun question. Does anyone know what the basal ganglia consists of? I think the state run actually has a different definition compared to what I have. So I'm going to use that definition before I confuse you guys. Let's see. Yes, yeah. Yep, those are a few things. That's okay. So you have, you definitely do have, okay, in the state, I mean, I'm going to mention this. This is for the state round, okay? The state round specifies that it has, yes, substantia nigra, um, the globus pallidus, the putamen, and the chordate nucleus. Now, some other textbooks or online can include other nuclei, and some exclude some nuclei, okay? But you just have to remember these four, particularly for the brain beam, okay? The one that stays, the ones that can stay consistent that you can just remember automatically would be chordate, putamen, globus pallidus, okay? So you just repeat it to yourself over and over in your head. It's just chordate, putamen, and globus pallidus, right? As a fun fact, globus pallidus has an external and an internal part. That's a side thing. Um, these, for me, at least when I was studying, what helped me remember a lot was learning a lot of extra fun facts or fun things that um, just make things more interesting so that I actually know more than I need to know. And sometimes it's not helpful, but for me, it helps me remember things. 
right? And the substantial nine gram. Now, now that you mentioned that, does anyone know what disease is implicated when there is damage to the substantial nine gram? Oh yeah, sure, no worries. Okay, so let me just rub this bit out. I think you guys don't need this. So it's gonna be, this is the basal ganglia. So you have the chordate, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. Yeah, these ones will not change. However, for the state round, it also, was oh, sort of a big fat star there. It's no longer a star to scribble, but the state round, just remember, it also includes the substantia nigra. Okay, so there are four nuclei for you guys to remember. All right. And yes, Parkinson's. Awesome, guys. So Parkinson's is what occurs when you get damage to the substantia nigra. Yeah? Does anyone know what the neurons are that are inside the substantia nigra? All the reason why you get some symptoms in Parkinson's. What, I guess, they form, when I mean what type of neurons? Yes, dopamine, yeah? Dopaminergic neurons. That's the proper way of describing, yes, what neurons, what kind, what kind of neurons they are and what they produce, yeah? So the substantia nigra um, produces most of the dopaminergic neurons um, inside the brain and they provide dopamine to everything. Yeah. And now in the state round, from what I remember, there are three main circuits they talk about regarding dopamine. Does anyone know what dopamine is? I guess in terms of the circuits, what functions they have, there are three key functions. There are more that I know of, but this is how the state round describes it. So I'm going to teach it like that. Can anyone from Chuck? Well, you don't have to know all three, you just know one, all things like that. Yes, movements, definitely. Yep, that's the one that's involved in Parkinson's. Anything else? No? Any last things? Okay, so dopamine's also involved in. Yes, there's also, yes, making you happy. <laughs> yeah, pleasure, yes, yes. Okay, happy hormone, however, um, it, I guess it is, um, but so is serotonin, technically. And I think serotonin is usually more associated with, I guess, happiness and mood rather than dopamine. And that's why in depression, um, they don't actually know, they think, I think they don't really know the main neurotransmitters involved, but it can, there's like a dopamine hypothesis and a serotonin hypothesis. And the serotonin one is the one that's kind of makes the most sense to me because it's the biggest, I guess, balance of mood, right? Okay, but yes, yes, movement, definitely. And that's why when you damage the substantial nigra, you get problems with movement. Now, the role of the substantial nigra and the dopamine there is that it helps inhibit movement, right? So it actually doesn't, trigger movement, it helps prevent like excessive movement, right? So when you get damage to it, that's how you develop the tremors in Parkinson's. Yeah. You get a pill, you actually get a pill rolling tremor. So I'll write the name of that. This is also another fun fact, but it's I mean if any of you are interested in medicine, things like that, and to, oh another thing from say I study medicine currently. Um so I'm actually at UNSW. And that's why you'll probably see me around uh, while well, I was supposed to be around for the Brain Bee Challenge. But um, I am boss this time. So, what was I saying again? I just can't remember what else. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm such a Niagara. Don't mean. Can you guys stroke my memory of what I was saying? <laughs> um, I'll say something about. I actually can't remember. Pill travel. Thank you. Okay. Pill rolling travel. I wanted to write that down for you guys. Roll in trouble. Now, what I'm, what, why this is important as well is that there's also a certain frequency that this, um, well, that occurs when you have a pill roll in trauma. But you have this, not only do you have this, but you have rigidity. So you have, um, you also have like a bunch of other things clinically. And I realize I'm going into too much detail regarding Parkinson's. But yes, pill roll in trauma, critical thing to know for brain B. I actually don't remember if this was for national or state. So I may be going a bit too far. 
right? Okay, so yes, Parkinson's, and you have other things. I think in your state round, it, the second circuit that they're talking about is emotion and cognition, and this is the one that they associate with schizophrenia. Okay, um, there is a third one involved, um, but there's also another one that I actually wanted to talk about more, and I feel like is genuinely more important, at least it's a better way of describing it. Now, the one I wanted to mention was reward, which is what someone mentioned, reward and pleasure. Um, this was covered in local round, so I don't know why this book doesn't really mention that before delving into everything else. But dopamine is a critical neurotransmitter that's involved in, um, you know, for example, in, yeah, in, in the reward system including the nucleus accumbens, if you guys remember that, right? Now, let me have a look. Okay, so the last, okay, yeah, the last circuit is just directing hormones, so helping regulate the endocrine system. I'm just going to write that down for you guys so you can remember. Yeah, so you have motor function, or movement, actually it's been the same movement. Movement? Yeah, movement's the first. Then you have emotion and cognition, I'm going to this, and I need to get some branches later, motion and cognition. Yep, and thirdly, you have endocrine control. Now, endocrine just refers to um, the system of hormones, which pretty much, they're very similar to neurotransmitters. The difference is that hormones just travel directly to your blood, yeah, via ductless glands. Now, so the best way to remember this is, I guess, remembering in terms of the diseases that are associated with damage. So all these, remember, these are all related for dopamine function. Yep. And as a side note as well, in state round, they're going to mention a term called catecholamines. Does anyone know what neurotransmitters count as a catecholamine? Yep, norepinephrine's one. Anything else? There are actually there are technically two more, but um, in the state round, the cover only one or two in total. Any other guesses? I accept guesses. Guesses are great because you learn best from mistakes. I have made many mistakes when I was studying brain B <laughs> and no, the stuff is great. Yeah, okay. Um, what? Yeah, dopamine. So the question was, Erica, the question was, what um, two neurotransmitters are uh, categorized as catecholamines? Catecholamines. This. Yeah, catecholamines. Now, like Ariel said, which is amazing, there are both the dopamine, dopamine's one of them. Dopamine and nor epinephrine. Now it's also good, it's good to hear someone say nor epinephrine out loud for you because it looks like a funky word and no one's going to be able to remember that, right? So nor epinephrine's the other one, yeah? Now there's technically a third one that isn't in the state round book, but just for your knowledge, it's just epinephrine, yeah? And epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. Yeah, so norepinephrine, noradrenaline is the same thing, epinephrine, adrenaline, exact same thing. Yeah, just different words. I don't remember, I forgot which one America uses, which one Australia uses, but I normally use epinephrine. Yeah, so dopamine, for now I'm just going to rub this off so you don't remember too much for the state round, I mentioned the wrong thing when you get quizzed. Okay, so for now I'm just going to say dopamine and norepinephrine. Okay, so these are just known as catecholamines. It just means that they have a very similar base structure. Yeah. There's nothing in particular that's common between, oh, I guess like between these two at least. Um, there is some things in common in that, uh, I don't think there's, I don't think they really overlap. I think they're just, cat they're, they only categorize as catecholamines because of the base structure is very similar to each other. Right. Yes, norepinephrine is involved in general, um, I think, I think autonomic nervous system stuff, right? A lot of smooth muscle control, um, 
including possibility, possibly heart rate and blood pressure by the top of my head right now. I can't really remember that. Yeah. So just remember, this is all norepinephrine. I'll be going through neurotransmitters and I'm running out of time, but that's okay. I'll be go I will be going through neurotransmitters very soon. Um, and I'll be going through at least, I'll give you guys a table to help you memorize neurotransmitters very easily. Okay. Because they're, they are a bit hard to remember. And dopamine array is amazing if you could already remember all the dopaminergic functions. And now norepinephrine, I can tell you now, is going to be arousal and smooth muscle control. So that when I ask you guys later, I'm going to expect you to remember it. Yeah? Because I'm going to just push you guys for smooth muscle control. Yeah? And by smooth muscle, I mean viscera. And when I mean viscera, I mean autonomic nervous system. Okay? I'll go through more detail once I finish my original brain diagram. Okay, so let's go back to here. I'm actually covering quite a bit. So I'm covering the two chapters and a little bit extra and the glossary and um, bit, some bits of movement and language. So this is really good revision, especially if you can combine everything together. Yeah, so going back to this, just quickly, occipital lobe, what's that in charge of, guys? I would recommend memorizing the glossary uh, from my experience. I, the glossary helped me a lot. Um, I just think that it's better learning because you you just genuinely know what each definition is. Vision, awesome. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Making my job much easier today, yeah? Vision, great. Okay, vision. The reason why is the very back of it, you have the primary visual cortex. Yeah. Now, there's a really good movie that I've seen recently. I'm not sure if you guys have seen Dunkirk. Um, there's an injury that occurs in there where somebody hits the back of the head and they go blind. Right. So that's if you ever forget, that's why that's why a lot of people who have injuries in the back of the head. They risk going blind, even if they don't actually lose any sight in the eye. OK, um, it's actually very, very important. Cool, okay, so we have vision done. We have all the basic lobes done. And, oh, very quickly, does anyone know the two parts of the brainstem? The big round bit here and the long bit here. And what the brainstem is in charge of or what functions they have. Yep, yeah. and what are the functions? I think in the textbook they talk about very generally, so. Yep, so it is not, yep, involuntary action. Yes, so it's in charge of um, kind of like autonomic involuntary, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, involuntary, which is the same thing as autonomic. I hope you guys have come across this word autonomic before, it's actually really important. Um, or autonomic function, including especially breathing, yeah. Breathing, breathing is a key one. Um, heart rate and a few other things as well. It's also involved in some sleep things and things like that. But very important. The reason why is because you have these cases where um, have, if you guys have had hydrocephalus where you get um, basically just, or, or even better thing, easier thing to think about, just higher intracranial pressure. Yeah, when you have, yeah, posture as well. Um, I think posture is more associated with the cerebellum, though. Um, but there is a tract that goes down the brainstem that does help with posture. So that's not technically wrong either. Okay, so, okay, now let's talk about something. I can lose my train of thought this one. Okay, uh, brain, oh, midbrain. Oh, okay, it's gonna cover the midbrain. So midbrain is the very last thing I'm going to talk to you guys about. Now, the midbrain, there are two parts of the midbrain. Do you guys know what it is? This is a bit of a bonus question because I don't expect you guys to know the second part. But the first part will be nice. I think it's in your textbook. So the two parts of your midbrain. Oh, I need to show you on my model where the midbrain is as well. Okay. Yes, the colliculi, not the limbic system. I'll explain what the limbic system is to you as well. But technically, yes, the colliculi. I'm going to draw brackets here because it's a better term for it. 
Yeah, it is. Yes, tag medicine. Yeah, so you have the tech tip. Yeah, tech tip, which I think in Latin was related to the word like covering roof or tent, something like that. Just remember that it's like the tent because it's on the outside um, of the midbrain. Yeah, so if I actually, if I go with the word temporal here and I drew the rest of like the brain stem on the midbrain part, so let's draw this as the midbrain. I'm gonna rub off all this. Okay, so this is inside your brain. We're just cutting through to looking at like the mid sagittal section. Yeah, so for now, you have these two bumps, and at the back of it is your huge cerebellum here. That's just huge cerebellum, and this is your this connects to the main stalk of the brain, right? These two bumps, those are your colliculi. Yeah, and that's known as detective. The second part is the tegmentum. I think that's how you pronounce it. Sorry if I don't know how to pronounce things after studying it for how many years now? It's been like five years. <laughs> yeah, take a here. Yeah? And this has a lot of other, uh, it has a lot of key nuclei. If you guys have heard of the red nucleus before, this is located inside the tegmentum. And this has the periaqueductal gray. Does anyone know what the periaqueductal gray does? <laughs> Or oh, what it's associated with. It's also known as PAG. I think this has popped up before. Um, no? Okay. It's associated with pain. Yeah? With pain conduction. So um, that's that in the red nucleus. Red nucleus has a tract that kind of is apparently not that useful in humans anymore. But that's inside your tegmentum. Yeah? And in your midbrain, it's a very small structure. It's just this little bit here. Okay, and to show you on this bit here, right? Oh, actually, sorry, I'm going to use the same side again. Here, it's just this little bit here. Yeah, so this is your pons, this is your medulla, this is your midbrain, and this is your colliculi, the two bumps in the back here, right? And this is your cerebellum. Does that make sense? Okay, and this is your thalamus. Your hypothalamus is actually a little bit in front of your thalamus. So the joke is that there is a part of the thalamus that is a little bit in front of the prethalamus and that the hypothalamus is actually below the prethalamus. They discovered that later. So that's why the hypothalamus is at an angle. Like I was saying at the beginning of class, it is directly inferior. Rather, it was a little sort of ventral, but it's a bit more anterior. Yeah. Now, also just on that topic, does anyone know what the hypothalamus does? Well, so guys, yeah, so that I'm going to move on to talking about the limbic system. I need to mention that as well. Yes, regulate hormones. Anything in particular, there are actually a lot of really key things you guys should know. You should just yell out different functions. Yes, very, very, very good buddies, the pituitary. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, sleep. There you go, Grace. I'm looking for sleep. Okay. It does definitely regulate body temperature, is the other one, and it does help control pituitary. So, actually, there's, there's a lot of functions. The hypothalamus is, you can talk about a whole different topic with the hypothalamus. Okay. But definitely, one is, this is in no order, but regulating hormone, regulates, sorry, regulates hormone production like somebody just accidentally said, and this is in relation to the pituitary gland. Now, I love the pituitary gland purely because it's known as the master gland, but it's not the actual real master. Yeah, and that real master is the hypothalamus, okay? So, yes, regulates hormone production, um, especially by the pituitary gland. Um, also, other things, the other really big thing is, yes, also um, regulating temperature. So that's how you start feeling cold and um, hot. Third thing uh, that's really key is sleep. And the reason why I'm stressing sleep is just because it's a whole chapter in your stay ground, okay? And also, as a tip for the actual brain we day and for any future exams you have, sleep is so important. As you probably know now from studying a bit of neuroscience, that's when you actually consolidate memory, okay? Each cycle of sleep consolidates memory better and better.
And does anyone remember what receptor slash receptors that are involved in long-term potentiation? This is just a fun question to put in. It's also in another chapter, I think, learning your memory. There it is. Yep, NMDA. NMDA. Um, as a side thing as well, you actually don't need to remember the full name like I did for fun. Oh, that's okay. I was asking what um, receptor is involved in long-term potentiation, yeah, which is regards to memory. So the strength of memory or the strength of the synapses that form um, is related to the MDMA receptor. And now as a bonus question, yeah, it is. <laughs> now, um, Mehdi, I don't know if, that's how, if I'm pronouncing your name right, but do you know what neurotransmitter goes, um, well, I guess what neurotransmitter triggers that receptor? Oh, and this is an open question to anyone. If anyone knows what neurotransmitter triggers that receptor. No? Okay. So I'm going to be going into neurotransmitters now. And I need to answer Grace's question about limbic system. But glutamate, yes, glutamate. Okay? It is glutamate. Sodium is not a uh, neurotransmitter. But before I go into neurotransmitters and forget, Grace, for limbic system, now what the limbic system is, is very, it's very, I guess, a lot of textbooks will explain this now as well. It's a very archaic way of looking at, um, I guess, the emotional cortex, or like at least the parts of the brain that are involved in emotions, things like that, right? Now, a lot of different parts of the brain are involved in the limbic system, including the amygdala, a really big one, and the cingulate gyrus, right? And the cingulate gyrus kind of encircles the corpus callosum that's around here. Yeah, so just for you guys to remember that, yeah. Now, and I don't know which what your state realm says, but just remember the definition that your state realm gives you regarding um, what the limbic system is and how much you need to know about it and to what research if you need. But this is just, I guess, an updated version, you know, five or seven years later, <laughs> right? Okay, now what I'm going to cover really quickly before I finish up is I'm going to cover some neurotransmitters because I think out of the rest of the topics, you guys might want to know that the best, I hope. Okay, so just to get my trusty whiteboard marker and hmm. okay. there's one other thing that I also would like to cover. But also, are most of you guys, what school are you guys from? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> um, I know some of you, but I know one of you actually, that's about it. <laughs> okay, so whilst, you. I'm going to draw up the table. Okay, so these are some neurotransmitters you're going to remember. Neurotransmitters, okay? And I want to give their function. This is just shorthand for function for me, okay? Before I finish up, because um, we're actually. I actually don't know where William Carey is. <gasps> wow, okay. This is great. I'm really glad I'm reaching out to other people. Armadale is amazing. Okay. I have a friend that studies medicine in Armadale at the moment. But okay, neurotransmitters. First one, let's talk about glutamate. Now, actually, before we even talk about this, can anyone so oh western stuff? Okay, great. Good. I'm a I'm a Southwest rep, so I'm from I'm from Bankstown. <laughs> I went to James Bruce. Okay, now um ooh. <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay, so before I get distracted anymore. Could, could you guys, this is not related to function, oh, it is actually, could you guys name me the three categories of neurotransmitter function? Like if we had to, some, okay, actually to make it easier, can you give me two categories? These are the only two that most people think about when they think about neurotransmitter. So for example, if I gave you glutamate, they'll be like, oh, is it this kind of neurotransmitter or is it this kind of neurotransmitter, right? So what are the two main functions of yeah, yes, area inhibitory and excitatory, and yes, the third one is modulatory. Yeah, so you guys are covered. It's great. Okay, so let's do excitatory first because everyone loves excitatory. Excitatory, inhibitory, and modulatory. Okay, now this is super, super, super important because 
in your textbook and in I think in the local round it was very very poorly explained in the local round. Um, the okay, so neurotransmitters they most people the reason why it's very confusing is because they only see it most people only see it as excitatory or inhibitory. Yeah, so that's not the case for well, neurotransmitters as you can guess. Some are modulatory. So what I mean by this is that they modulate some, um, they modulate like the later actual, the other neurons that they affect. But this can can either mean that they can excite or inhibit. It doesn't really matter. Or they might do neither. Okay. So that's why we I break it into this third category that people don't really talk about. It just makes life easier. But technically under modulatory, it can be excitatory or inhibitory. Okay. Now, to think about it though, excitatory and inhibitory. This is related to this is related to neurophysiology, which I wanted to cover and I don't have time for. I very, very drastically did not estimate my time very well, but let's draw you let's draw you an action potential. Okay. Um, can anyone tell me where which or what part of the neuron would it'd be most important to experience the right amount of voltage so that an action potential is triggered. It's a very particular point that I want someone to identify for me. That's fine. Let's see if there's anything else that I miss. Is that it? Okay. Oh, sorry, special. This is at negative 50. And this is negative percent. Okay, I'm going to explain that better because the diagram is a bit small. Yes, Axe and Hillock. Great, guys. Okay, now this is a very terrible diagram of an action potential, but from what you guys probably know, I'd love to explain action potentials in a lot more detail. I don't think I have time to cover it though, because I also need to get home and do my own assignments. <laughs> um, but what neurons, uh, well, in, a, in an action potential, you have the resting membrane potential. Now, does anyone, because my handwriting is terrible here anyway, does anyone know what the resting membrane potential is? The exact amount in millivolts? Yep, negative 70. Great, guys. Okay, so it's at negative 70. Now, bonus question, does anyone know why it's at negative 70? I'll be really, really, really impressed if someone can get this. Or can even get a little bit about it, because it's actually quite a complicated topic. Does anybody know any any ions involved? Oh, oh no. Yes, yes, that's one aspect, yes. What about... What about this? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Getting there, we're getting there, guys. Okay, so we're getting hints, bits and pieces. Okay, yes, there is more potassium inside, yes. Um, but that's not the reason why that it's negative 70, okay? Now, the way to think about it, and this is also why neurophysiology is quite confusing, is because we're talking about ions and potassium and sodium and from what we know and from what you guys know from chemistry they're positive ions right so you'd think that they'd be positive but the thing is that we're talking about membrane potentials now yeah so if i drew you a phosphate bilipid layer which i don't have time to explain but let's just say this is your layer and this is inside the cell and this is outside the cell yeah inside the cell there is a lot more potassium ions then outside the cell, it's actually, I don't remember the ratio, but I think there's like 150 and five, like that kind of ratio, yeah? Um, yeah, there's some aspects of diff diffusion isn't that big of a deal, but um, I mean, it is, yes, it actually is a big deal, but the, the thing I'm looking for to describe is the fact that um, these potassium ions, they have an equilibrium potential at around negative 90. Now, what I mean by that is when we only look at, because when you have a cell, you have so many different types of ions. From what you can guess from the Brain Bee textbook and from what they've explained, um, the main two you always talk about is sodium and potassium, right? Now, there are other things like calcium, um, 
yes, there is a concentration difference. They're, they're all related and this is all correct technically, but what I'm looking for is that, um, yes, this concentration difference creates a potential. Yeah? So this potential for potassium, because it's more inside, it's, I guess, it's not a positive, um, we're talking, okay, I think to add perspective, um, and this is really hard to describe, potassium, as now we know, is around, not negative 70, sorry, potassium is around negative 90, okay? So for potassium, um, the membrane potential, let me do the picture, there's a, I think it's just EK. The potential for potassium is around negative 90, okay? So it doesn't require much effort at all for it to like move out as it does for it to move in, okay? So, yeah. Calcium ion, yes, has two positive charges, but it's a different thing because there's not a lot of calcium involved in um, the resting membrane potential. At least it doesn't affect it as much. So what happens is, what I'm getting to is that the potassium equilibrium potential, this negative 90, because there is so much more potassium, compared to sodium or calcium, but in this case, calcium is so little, it doesn't even matter. If there's, because there's so much potassium compared to sodium, the resting membrane potential, okay? The resting membrane, mem I'm just gonna do MV, okay? Resting membrane potential is going to be closer to the potassium's membrane potential. Yeah, well, potassium's equilibrium potential. Yep, yeah? this is known as equilibrium. I don't know if you guys have covered this in chemistry yet, but it's just basically when you have like a balance between um, gradients, yeah? Well, there's no gradient because there's a balance, right? Um, equilibrium. There's a lot more to that concept, but that's me simplifying it a lot. Equilibrium um, membrane potential, yeah? Um, or just equilibrium potential. All right, okay, so resting membrane is negative 70 because it's closer to this because there are more potassium ions, right? In comparison, there are fewer, much fewer sodium ions the ratio is the other way around, so there's more sodium outside than inside. But compared to potassium, it's only like, you know, a much fewer amount of sodium compared to the whole heap of potassium there, right? So sodium has a membrane potential of, I think, sorry, has an equilibrium potential of around positive something, I think positive 40 or 30. And that's why this resting membrane potential, which is a balance of all the ions, all ions, since it's a balance of all that, it balances out, you know, the ratios, they weight, basically the way how much each um, ion influences things, right? And for potassium, it influences so much more because there's so many of them. And that's why it's close to negative 90, but it is a little bit more positive because of the sodium and the other things, right? Okay, so that's a very quick debrief and explanation of how what resting membrane potentials are and why those numbers exist and what this is but essentially another thing that you final thing that i really want you guys to note before i go through neurotransmitters quickly is that zero is here okay we go up positive this way negative this way for the active potential yeah so the active potential starts off as in the negative right and yes it's um I don't know if you just wrote message that Eric up or if that was from before, but um, does any, what, what it's called is when you go up towards this way, this is known as depolarization. Okay, so you have the threshold, the normal, I said this is a threshold, and this is the resting membrane potential. Then when you get a stimulus here, if the stimulus is high enough, these aren't high enough, they don't trigger anything. But once it's higher than this threshold, it will shoot up and fully depolarize, right? So all right, I'll say that again. When you have your resting membrane potential and there is a stimulus that is significantly higher than the threshold level, which is negative 55, once it surpasses negative 55, it will go up and cause a spike. Now that spike is depolarization, depolarization. Sorry, I don't have any more colored pens. Um, I accidentally brought all really thin pens and you can't actually see it on the board. So <laughs> blue is the only one that really works well, okay? That first upward bit towards zero is depolarization. Yeah, no, this is insane. Any, every movement you do, every little thing, even 
when you create a thought, right? This millions and millions and billions, like just an infinite, almost an infinite number of these are going off, right? Now, your axons are, well, this is being depolarized, and when it's depolarized, does anyone guess, can anyone guess about what ions are involved in depolarization or what channels open when a neuron depolarizes, right? And remember, depolarize just means, come on, this all out. So it's clearer. Depolarization just means, you know, going towards zero. Towards zero. So you're becoming more positive or you're losing direction, right? Yes, sodium. Great. So sodium channels open. Okay? So sodium channels open and then at some point they do shut. Okay? Um, they just won't let anymore because it's we've reached so far beyond the original resting membrane potential. Yeah. So what happens is there's potassium channels open here. Yeah. So this first bit is sodium, this next bit is potassium. Potassium channels open and they bring this back down towards potassium again. But this is weird bit here. Right? We only wanted to get back to the resting membrane potential, but there's this overshoot. Does anyone know what this overshoot is called? Normally, stimulus, oh, we full resting member potential stimulus, depolarization, repolarization, something. Yes, hyperpolarization. Now, the reason why that is because remember, neurons, action potentials, all that, they're all polarized, they all have direction. Yeah, that's what polarization is, you have direction. So, when you're depolarizing, you're heading towards zero because there's less direction, even though you're going all the way up like that, right? And when you repolarize, going back down because now you're increasing the polarization or the direction again back to the original direction. It's like vectors if you guys do physics, right? So after repolarization, you overshoot, and that overshoot in particular is known as hyper, yeah? Hyperpolarization. And then that settles again and goes back to normal. Okay, so um, that's a very brief overview because I'm running very, very over time, but this is, I hope that clarifies a little bit about what action potentials are, how, what this graph actually means, and how that works. Um, it's not covered very well, but they also expect you to know it quite well, so it's a bit contradictory. Okay, so I'm just going to rub this off for now, and I'm going to go, okay, that's good. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, <laughs> glad that helped. I wish I could spend more time and I had my proper projector up, but I don't. <laughs> And hopefully I will run, do you guys find these workshops or well, this workshop helpful so far? Because I kind of want to run more at some point in my life. <laughs> even if you're just interested in neuroscience, even after brain beef. So I have a lot of fun things planned with YNA. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to send the, um, I think because I'm running out of time. No, I think I'll have, I'll have enough time. I'll stay for another 10 minutes. If you guys aren't in a rush. Okay. I, I will I will run another one, hopefully. Okay. Now, neurotransmitters. Remember, we're talking about, just to test you guys again, what are the three types? <laughs> I wish I had the time. All the money. Um, but, yeah, I also, as you guys probably know, I changed this one to being free just because um, I thought it would be a good trial. Anyway. So, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it a lot. Um, but I will be trying to keep it as free as I can. Okay, I, I believe in free education and I want to teach you guys because I love teaching. Okay, so remember, um, oops, my pen's not working anymore. My pen's not working anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, anyone, can anyone recall what the three types of neurotransmitters are? Your three categories? Really quickly, as I write up some neurotransmitters. So all of these ones that I'm writing, they will all be mentioned at some point. I will also be asking about what the full name of this neurotransmitter is, so if anyone can type it up, that'll be nice as well. Oops, close. Dopamine. Norepinephrine. And serotonin. There are a few more actually, but let's see if anyone. Yep, gamma, gamma amino butyric acid. 
Great. Yes, psychiatry, inhibitory, and modulatory. Awesome, guys. Great job. Another question just to ask him, where exactly is Broca's area located? Substance P. Substance P. Substance P. Yes, great job. Inferior frontal gyrus in particular, but yes, cortex. Yep, great. Okay, awesome. Now, I put up all the main um, neurotransmitters that. Is this one there? Oh, okay, good. Okay. Just making sure it wasn't off the screen. Okay, so um, these are the neurotransmitters. Now, I want you guys just to tell me, if I point to something, tell me if it's excitatory or inhibitory, and I will wait a few seconds so that I'm trying to get everyone to respond, but can anyone tell me what, if, the, if this is excitatory, inhibitory, or modulatory, GABA? And you say, I don't know if you don't know. Um, under acetylcholine is substance P. Sorry, that's really poor handwriting. Substance P. Yep, so, so, no, that's any clear. I'll rewrite it. So substance P, which is related to pain. Substance P. Oh, that's clearer. Yeah, yeah, great. Inhibitory. Great job, guys. This is inhibitory. And out of this list, is there anything else in particular that is inhibitory or purely inhibitory? So we have glutamate, aspartate, GABA, glycine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and substance P. Glycine. Yes. Excellent job. These two are inhibitory. Okay? They are involved in inhibition. I cannot spell it anymore. Inhibition. Yep. Okay. So just remember that you, it's like, this is in, um, I think, just remember that the main inhibitory um, neurotransmitter is GABA. This is very, very critical, as is glutamate. These two are very critical. Glutamate, as you probably know, and what I've been saying is this is excitatory. Okay. Um, which other neurotransmitter here is purely excitatory? Anyone you know? This is a little bit trickier. Okay, so the other excitatory one is aspartate. Okay, I was already putting my pen really early, <laughs> but yeah, aspartate. Yeah, these two are excitatory. Or they're involved in an excitation of the central nervous system. Okay, so glutamate, aspartate. Um, and these are both really key things in the CNS, okay? Not really, you don't really find any of these neurotransmitters outside the CNS, okay? Oops, I'm not drawing a line. That line is not being drawn. <laughs> I should have put more text in this. Okay, um, but yeah, this is very, very critical ones that you need to know. And last few things to cover, dopamine. Can you guys tell me the three circuits it's involved in? Yes, the rest are, uh, yeah, the rest are modulatory. I'd say the rest are modulatory, yeah. But the three main things don't mean involved in again. Yeah, movement's one. Three circuits, three key circuits he's talking about. And technically a fourth one. Mm hmm Yeah, okay. Yes, great. Yeah, so basically Medi's order is the best one for me, movement. Emotion, cognition, endocrine, but also reward. Reward's the fourth one that I want you guys to remember, although the state round doesn't get you guys to remember that. Okay, just don't accidentally put that instead on the thing because they might, I don't know if you can contest things on stage, but it's probably not ideal for them. Yeah? Okay, so yeah, don't mean those three things that you guys already know. So I'm just going to leave that there, three things. Um, so I don't have to write everything because we're running short on time. Yes. Um, now, norepinephrine. Okay, norepinephrine is related to mood. Yeah, oh no, mood, sorry. Take that back, take that back. It's arousal and, my pen's actually running out. It's arousal and smooth muscle control. Okay, so, let me see if I can still, I can write it. Arousal and smooth 
muscle control, okay? And by smooth muscle, I mean autonomic, but sadly today I didn't have time to go through the autonomic nervous system and all the things I had planned. But hopefully you guys can just remember that's arousal and autonomic control, okay? Now, the last three I want to talk about, substance P is very easy. Um, it's just pain, yeah, pain signaling. There are a few other functions with it, but um, I think it's the one that most people already kind of know. Yeah, that's the one that gets triggered when you have any chili and stuff like that. Yeah, yes, yes, Grace. Norepinephrine, dopamine, um, they're both modulatory. And this is a, dopamine is an excellent example to show you how it's modulatory but also has excitatory and inhibitory functions. Yeah, because by modulatory, what I mean is they can do both excitation and inhibition, but they're not strictly like these ones, they're not strictly excitation or inhibition. Yeah, so dopamine it actually has inhibitory functions in the movement system, but in the reward system, it has I think it has excitatory functions. Yeah, so it's different. There are different receptors for it as well. Yeah. Now, the last few things. So this is for norepinephrine. Well, serotonin and acetylcholine. Okay. Now, serotonin is the one that is more related as a happy one. Yeah, the happy hormone. Right, or not, it's not technically a hormone, happy neurotransmitter. Yeah, so this one is in relation to mood relaxation, mood relaxation, and sensory processing. Yeah, but the main one you have to remember is just mood relaxation. Okay, um, this other one isn't that big of a deal. Okay, um, at least in the state round. Yeah, and the last thing I'm going to mention is acetylcholine. Now, just because it's a tricky one, regardless, does anyone know what acetylcholine is critical in? It's actually quite a few things, and there is an associated disease that you should know that affects acetylcholine receptors. Yes, 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 great. Yes, muscle contraction stuff, yes. Um, it, it, it can affect some heart um, function as well. Um, yes, it's also affected in Alzheimer's and um, definitely attention and memory. Yeah, but particularly attention, not so much memory. Attention is a bigger one. Yeah, so it's muscle autonomic muscle activation. Now, now that you mentioned muscle activation, what disease is associated with loss of acetylcholine um, function? Um, Do you guys know the disease name? There's a big disease. It's mentioned in um, the state round book, I think. Yes, myasthenia gravis. Okay. Myasthenia gravis. Okay. Yep. Now, myasthenia gravis, does anyone know what exactly is damaged in this disease and what occurs when you get this disease? And once we have this question, the little, well, I'll, I'll wrap up a little bit before we go. Yeah, does anyone know any guesses? It's it's related to acetylcholine function. Now, acetylcholine is involved in muscle activation. Yes, antibodies block the receptor, excellent. So they block the receptor for acetylcholine, so you can't really get any acetylcholine function. Yeah, okay, so myasthenia gravis is a result of, remember, you have neurotransmitters and you have receptors, okay? Receptors pick up the neurotransmitter. Now, when something else comes along, for example this, and blocks the receptor, that neurotransmitter can't, get in, right? That's what happens in myasthenia gravis, except this blocker, this blockage thing, this is actually a urine antibody, so it's an autoimmune disease, yeah? And what happens when you get this is muscles can't really get activated, you get very easily fatigued, you get very tired, okay? And um, like you just, it is very, very, it's not a good disease to have, okay? None, none of them are very good to have. Okay, now um, that wraps up everything for, well, it's not all the things I want to cover, it wasn't like a third of the stuff I wanted to cover, but hopefully this was really helpful. I have 
a link in this thing. I will link it here again as well because um, I want you guys to, if you can, fill out this survey for me just so that I know how to improve and um, if you guys want me to hold more workshops, things like that. It's very quick. It'll probably take like a minute at most. But it'd be lovely if you fill it out. Um, the Brain Beast State Round, I think, finishes at 4, 3 or 4 p.m. It usually finishes around then. There is lunch. You will find us, YNA, or YNA is youth here in Australia. We'll be, we'll be hosting a stall throughout the breaks and we'll be having a talk halfway. I won't be personally available like I was last year, but there will be people there that you can feel free to talk to. Please sign up to our website or like us on Facebook to keep updated with events, but definitely signing up on the website or being on the mailing list. We'll tell you about future workshops. So even beyond Brain B, what we're hosting next year actually and later this year is we're having a series of like we have a partnership with the Department of Education. So we're actually doing a lot of really, oh, it's not unavailable. Oh, no, that's not good. One sec. I think I linked the wrong thing. One sec. Um, it's also in the description of the page, but let me link it one more time. All right, I think this is the one that has access, not the, not the form document. <laughs> yeah, okay, that should work. Okay, um, yeah, so what YNA does is we, we don't only just focus on neuroscience. Neuroscience is our specialty. Oh, my goodness, okay. Let me ask. If not, what we're going to do is I'm going to just email you guys because this is my coordinator. Sorry. Um, I just saw my corner, but I'm going to email you guys a link and please, please, please fill it out for me if you can. It will help me a lot. Um, yeah, we'll be hosting a lot of fun workshops. If you're not even interested in neuroscience anymore, we have a lot of STEM things. And yeah, I hope I hope everything was useful. You can go back to this live stream. There'll be a link. I'll post it up publicly on um, the YouTube channel. No worries. It's my, my pleasure. It was really fun to do this. Um, hopefully next time as well. I will have things a little bit more in advance because we planned this a little bit last minute. Uh, it was great talking to you guys and helping you guys. And so far, it seems like the webinar worked out quite well. Um, yeah, otherwise, if there are no more questions or anything about YNA, feel free to email um, YNA uh, inquiries at yna.org.au or go to our website or Facebook. I'll be around uh, so someone else will contact you. But, yeah, good luck for the challenge. You guys will be fine. I went through some very hard things, so if you can remember any of those um, or a lot of them, a lot will be great. Um, that, like, it will be excellent, okay? Then there won't be so much work learning, but you'll know a lot of things, okay? So thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to end the live stream now. The link will be up. Hopefully soon I'll email it again when it's on our YouTube channel. Yeah, or just check out our YouTube channel as well. Yeah, and subscribe. Subscribing would be nice. Okay. Thank you, guys. Take care. Good luck. Okay.